This is an exam cram video for SysB Domain 1, Security and Risk Management. Memorizing textbook concepts, of course, isn't going to pass the exam for you. It's not going to make you good at security either. On the exam front, the SysB exam questions are brain benders. They're designed to make you think and draw from your four to five years of practical experience. But memorizing these concepts certainly doesn't hurt. It's a foundation, a base, and it's a start. And so I'm not one of the people who says that if you wrote memorizing things to get ready for exam day, you have the wrong mindset. My approach is to do lots of this, do lots of reading, watching, and listening, do a lot of practice questions, and try to learn the material back to front and front to back. And that's not going to hurt. It's probably going to help, and probably going to help with two things. Like One, in practical application, if you know some concepts uh, really well, it's going to help you put them in your mind's eye so you can attack them from all angles. And then number two, exam specific, it's going to improve your odds of success on exam day. It's not enough, but it's going to improve uh, your odds. And, or like Pete Zerger says in his awesome videos I'll link to, memorization will help ease the process. So that's the focus today. It's going to be a little dry. It's going to be reading less than showing pictures. This is a niche video for people studying that want to watch and listen while they're doing the dishes, driving, or working out to reinforce SISPI concepts. Another important note on scope today is that it's not going to be comprehensive. It's focused on about 20 to 40% of key concepts in Domain 1 with an emphasis on legal and regulatory terminology. This is my personal study focus after getting some practice questions wrong in these areas and from seeing concepts that were new or of particular interest that I want to get more familiar with. Hedge fund billionaire CEO and leadership guru Ray Dalio says in his five-step process for getting what you want out of life that some great learning and improvement happens after you encounter a problem in step two, like getting a practice question wrong, and then you diagnose what happened in step three by studying more in that area, and then step four, design a plan to get it right next time, like making an exam cram cheat sheet and doing more practice questions. So I need to study right now. Let's get into it. All right, on my left, you can see a Word doc of my exam cram focus areas, my run sheet of key concepts. On the right, you can see a browser where I want to show as many pictures and basically public websites as I can to try to give a visual aid to sear into our brains along with just doing repetitions with these concepts and terminology on the left. I find in the SISP study literature out there, there's a lot of death by PowerPoint, and it's nice to get some pictures and images and, and real life examples where possible. All right, so let's run through it. You can see that the outline here, 1.1, 2, and 1.3, aligns to the domain one uh, list of topics from iscsquared.org, from their certification exam outline. And we'll go to the top. One, one, understand, adhere to, and promote professional ethics. So I'll pull up also from iscsquared.org their code of ethics canons, which is PAPA, protect society, the common good, necessary public trust and confidence, and the infrastructure. Act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. Provide diligent and competent services to principals. Advance and protect the profession. So protect, act, provide, advance, PAPA, and a distractor. So this is the Computer Ethics Institute. If you see something like, thou shalt not use a computer to bear false witness, that's the distractor. That's not the ISC squared canon. Don't select it from your multiple choice. Moving on to section two, understand and apply security concepts. I'm pretty comfortable with the C, the I, and the A triad. Interesting that they added on authenticity and non-repudiation. So authenticity, very relevant with deepfakes uh, being a trending topic. So authenticity means it's genuine, verified to be from the claimed origin, not a deep fake. And how are we going to solve the deep fake problem? Uh, one idea I've seen out there is public key infrastructure. So give the content creator a hash signed by the, their private key that you can decrypt with the public key to ensure it's authentic. The challenge there, of course, is who's going to manage the keys. Next, non-repudiation. The subject of an activity can't deny that an event occurred or was done by them or by you know, someone else. So here the threat actor identity is known and they can't cover their tracks. They can't delete the logs. They're all going into the SIM and the SIM has least privilege access and is tamper proof. All right. One, three, evaluate and apply security governance principles. So I didn't find a clear definition of what cybersecurity governance is in the literature. There's a lot of words used, but it's hard to grasp what is it specifically. I like a simpler definition that I got from the father of GRC Gartner guy. It's not from the CISPI literature, but in, in general, what do you get when you have good governance? You get that everyone knows the company's risk appetite 
and makes decisions that are aligned to it. That's the outcome. And it starts with the board. So aligned to this in our study material is COBIT. Now that was under the security control framework section because in the COBIT toolkit, you can find here, right there, there's a spreadsheet that lists a bunch of controls. For example, APO 07.01, evaluate internal and external staffing requirements. Um, but if we just zoom out from that list of uh, controls for IT governance, what it's all about is having uh, good governance for IT at your company. And that's why they use it in their banner and their main homepage, effective IT governance at your fingertips. So how are you going to get that? Well, there's six core key principles that we need to commit to memory. N10 governance system. So it talks about how with digital transformation and every business being a software business, we're getting these new risks that are associated with that. And so we want to uh, mitigate that risk and get the business value. Next, provide stakeholder value. So similar to ITIL, a focus on outcomes, a focus on being an enabler. And the three main outcomes are benefits realization, risk optimization, and resource optimization. It's a holistic approach, not just the IT department. It's a team sport. You know, everybody plays a part in digital transformation and in, in under the CISO org and in cybersecurity. Governance is distinct from management, so we need some independence. We need the three lines of defense uh, if you're at that regulated scale, or at least having a, an independent board of directors that can give some feedback to the CEO and the management team if, uh, if, if needed. Uh, dynamic governance system and tailored to enterprise needs. That's COVID in a nutshell. And I encourage you to check out that toolkit uh, at isaka.org. Next is ITIL, Information Technology Infrastructure Library. So the, uh, here's their ancient website where when I click something, it doesn't take me anywhere. And, but I did find a better picture, the ITIL picture, uh, right here in this Medium blog post. I'm going to link to all this stuff. And this is what I think of when I think of ITIL. You have a service catalog. You have a help desk that you contact, and the number includes H-E-L-P, help, right? We're user-friendly IT people. We have a strategy, and then how to have a service design transition operation, a mature business process to enable business outcomes, and wrapped around continuous improvement. So that's ITIL. Next was getting into due diligence versus due care. Due diligence is before the decision. Establishing a plan, policy, or process to protect the interests of the organization. It's knowing what should be done and planning for it. So again, it's before the decision. Research, plan, and evaluate. Research new systems before implementing them and think before you act. Next, do care. This is after the decision is made. Practicing the individual activities that maintain the due diligence effort. Taking the right action at the right time. It's uh, about actions, speak louder than words, and act on the knowledge. Next in 1.4, determine compliance and other requirements. I'm a compliance guy, so I was comfortable there. 1.5, understand legal and regulatory issues. So now we're getting into some regulations that need some, some memorization. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Let's take a look at it. There it is under criminal law. So it was the first major U.S. cybercrime legislation. It's the most commonly used law to prosecute cybercrimes. It protects computers used by the U.S. government, financial institutions, and it trickled down into critical infrastructure with extended coverage with the National Information Infrastructure Protection Act of 1996. Next is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which uh, makes it a crime to invade the electronic privacy of an individual. So you take a Udemy pen testing course, don't hack into your neighbor's Wi-Fi. That's going to be a violation of the ECPA. Up next is the Federal Sentencing Guidelines. Provides punishment guidelines to help federal judges interpret computer crime laws. Next is FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act. Not to be confused with the first Google search result I got, which was the Modernization Act on CISA's website. So this one, the Management Act, requires federal agencies to implement information security programs. Next, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This old PDF here protects digital media for copyright protection, and limits the liability of internet service providers for activities of their users. Up next, we've got GDPR. So that's 
the EU's new data protection law, I don't think it's that new anymore, and we know it's the high watermark of privacy law that impacts the EU and uh, North American companies that have EU customers. The toughest privacy security law in the world. There you go. So we need to know that this relates to right to access, right to erasure, right data portability, data breach notification, privacy by design, and to have a data protection officer. A couple of points on uh, applying GDPR concepts. If you have two companies transferring data between the US and Europe, your best control is contractual clauses between those entities. If you have one, corpora one corporation with divisions in different countries, one in the EU, one outside of it, you could use binding corporate rules, but that only works if it's controlled by one company. And then there's this concept of privacy shield, which used to work, but doesn't anymore as of 2020. All right, up next we have the Lanham Act. That's for trademarks. And here it is in the FTC's website. Graham Leach Bliley. I've seen that one before. This is about financial institutions it's protecting financial institution data. HIPAA, that's a big one. Oh, ECPA, that was earlier. Uh, when we talked about uh, not hacking your neighbor's Wi-Fi. This is why. Next, health and also ethics, the IC Square Code of Ethics, of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, HIPAA, so this is a big one, and you can see, importantly, it has three tabs we need to know. It's related to privacy, security, and breach notification. Those are the rules that are related to HIPAA, if you see those on the exam. If you see encryption rule, that's a distractor, so is the disclosure rule, right? It's called the breach notification rule. Up next, the Bureau of Industry and Security for encryption export regulations is not a subset of HIPAA, that should stand on its own. And its website is currently down, biz.doc.gov. I've seen it before. It said encryption on it. And uh, we'll move on. Or it said export on it, export, uh, of which uh, encryption is, is very important. Communication Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALIA. Getting into privacy, let's take a look at that. Instituted by Congress in 1984 to require telecommunications carriers and manufacturers of telco equipment to design things so that they have necessary surveillance capabilities to comply with legal requests or lawful access requests. Next, we've got the Privacy Act of 1974. There it is. It's about electronic eavesdropping. I think it talks about phone lines, but, so, um, but that's what we need to know. COPA, consent for data if kids are younger than 13 years old. Take a look at that one from the FTC website. COPA imposes certain requirements on operators of websites or online services directed to children under 13 years of age. All right. Glass-Steagall Act. A distractor. It's about banking reform, not to do with information security. If you see it, don't choose that answer. Economic Espionage Act. Focus on stealing trade secrets from U.S. corporations. That was interesting. When I think of espionage, I think James Bond, I think government... The scope of this is very much focused on uh, corporations. Includes would include something like taking a customer list to another company, and it's harsher penalties in dollars and jail time if you if the individual knows that the theft of IP benefits a foreign government or agent. So I think it goes from a quarter of a million dollars in ten years to half a million dollars in uh, fifteen years, uh, depending on um, that threshold. Next, the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, contains the text of all administrative laws promulgated by federal agencies. There's a word I didn't know before, the CISPI study. So here it is, big government website, and lots and lots of uh, fed, long list of related um, government entities and processes. All right, intellectual property protection and licensing, we're getting into copyright. Copyrights last seven years after creator's death. You don't need to apply to be protected, unlike with patents and trademarks that you need to apply for. We saw the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So if you see that, that's the one for copyright, not the Lanham Act, GLB, or the Prudent Man Rule. We saw the first two a minute ago. Trade secrets, not trade secrets plus, need to be tightly controlled within a single company. 
And an example of one is the KFC blends of herbs and spices. They didn't apply for it. They didn't disclose it. They just hold on to that secret. Trademarks need to be registered, valid for 10 years, and can be renewed indefinitely. That's logos, product names, etc. Patents protects inventions for 20 years from when you apply, not from when it's granted. Patent protection does not apply to mathematical algorithms, but crypto algorithms can be patented. I'm not savvy enough on patents and crypto to reconcile those two points, but that's interesting. The patent must be for a novel, useful, and not obvious invention. And if you want a joint venture or collaboration between companies to protect intellectual property, patents is the way to go. Unlike a trade secret, you know, in which you don't disclose it, it's heavily guarded. Licensing. Oh, right. There's different types, contractual, shrink wrap, um, and for old school software, you'd buy off the shelf and click through. If you wanna use this free service, you need to agree to these conditions. One six, understand requirements for investigation types. So criminal is the murder, assault, robbery, arson, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, civil law, contracts, real estate, employment, and you need the majority of proof between those arguing parties. And administrative, that's government stuff enacted by government agencies, such as, for example, taxes and minimum wage. And this is where HIPAA, FDA, and FAA rules would apply. All right, I'm comfortable with security policy standards and guidelines because I'm a GRC person. One eight, business continuity. I was full-time business continuity starting out my career. I'm pretty comfortable there. Some notes I made is that the best person to approve a BCP is the CEO. I guess I was thinking that they're too high up to uh, be involved in a plan. However, that makes sense. They're accountable, so they should, you know, they can sign off. And then another question I encountered had to do with who should be on the BCP team. And I thought, well, no, a member of senior manager shouldn't be involved. We don't want them interfering, asking for status updates when the people on the front lines are solving the problem. However, for sponsorship, you should have at least one member of senior management on the business continuity plan team. All right, uh, cold sites have communication but no hardware. Warm and hot sites have hardware. RAID is fault tolerance and not business continuity. DR and moving to a cold site is real. Um, is, so DR would be moving to a cold site. DR is not having fault tolerance. That's high availability. Kate, one nine. I just want to commit to my memory. I'm very familiar with ISO 27001 and 2. Um, I'm not familiar with 27004 for metrics, measuring the success of your ISMS, information security management system. And by the way, the PDAC, BDCA here is about plan, do, check, act, continuous improvement in a management system. ISO 27005 is risk management. I'm an RMF, NIST RMF person, so I don't, I don't use this one. And then ISO 27799 is for protecting public health information. All right, 1.10, risk management concepts. So for the RMF, which I just mentioned, that's NIST special publication 800-37. People can see I am always monitoring. So let's take a look at that picture. Oh, this was just showing ISO, all right, the, the, the health one. And now we're into NIST RMF. Let's see the wheel. People, prepare, can, categorize, see, select, <laughs> implement, assess, authorize, monitor. And that is the NIST RMF. Up next, quantitative risk analysis. So assign an asset value, assign an exposure loss, which is the loss potential. Calculate the single loss exposure, which is asset value times exposure factor. Assess the annual rate of occurrence. Calculate the um, annual loss expectancy, which is the single loss expectancy times the annual rate of occurrence. And then analyze the cost of the fence, which is your cybersecurity control, and your cost of your horse, which is the asset you're protecting. So you wouldn't buy a fence more expensive than the horse you want the fence to protect. All right, we'll keep rolling. Defense in depth. I've heard it called expense in depth, uh, but it's fair that security is complicated and layered and includes all of these. Layering, classification, zones, realms, compartments, silos, segmentation, lattice structure, protection rings. That's not a list to memorize and it's not comprehensive. The idea is that the number of components of defense in depth is many. It's very broad. We can check out the fan. Is that what I've got here? Yeah. So 
This is the fan. We have our assets and then we layer on data security, application security, endpoint security, network security, and perimeter security. And then we need policy management and preventive controls. But uh, you know, according to NIST CSF, we need to be able to detect, respond, and recover after something bad happens, right of boom. Or after boom happens, we need steps right of boom. So operations, monitoring, and response. All right. Risk maturity model, I've got a picture of. It's an industry standard approach for assessing the process used to manage risk. Here it is. It's got the CMMI phases, but it's not CMMI, okay? It's the risk maturity model. 1.11, understand and apply threat modeling concepts and methodologies. So uh, threat modeling is the security process where potential threats are identified, categorized, and analyzed. Stride came from Microsoft. It's software focused. What could go wrong? Well, we could have spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, or elevation of privilege. I've got an OWASP cheat sheet here explaining those. And next we have DREAD. Another OS, OWASP resource here talking about DREAD. D, damage, R, reproducibility. E, exploitability. A, affected users. D, discoverability. How easy is, is it to discover the threat? So this is attacker-focused objectives. And its output is a risk value. And it has a formula for that here. Pasta, that's asset value focused right here next in the OWASP cheat sheet. And it's a risk-centric approach. We should select or develop controls in relation to the value of the assets to be protected. That's the name of the game in uh, security is prioritizing and taking a risk-based approach. Vast, visual, age, agile, simple threat based on agile principles. I think I've got a little Wikipedia article, yep. Based on Threat Modeler, a commercial automated threat modeling platform. VAST requires creating two types of models, application threat models and operational threat models. Application threat models use process flow diagrams representing the architectural point of view. Operational threat models are created from an attacker point of view based on the data flow diagrams. All right, and that's it. We're almost done. Supply chain risk management. If a supplier doesn't meet your requirements, for example, having MFA on their product, what do you do? Well, you would void their authority to operate. I guess if you're a federal agency uh, or the equivalent of what you consider an authority to operate as a bank or a commercial entity. Next, hacking a web server in IAS is not a supply chain attack. So if we have a web server and we host it in AWS or Azure, it's our problem and not Microsoft or Amazon's problem because that web server is in our direct control. And that rounds out the list for domain one exam cram. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you're finding value. If you are, please subscribe and uh, good luck in your studying. We'll see you next time.